We can clip it later. It's got four hours on it. <laughs> so we also usually go around the room and everybody just says very briefly their name, okay. their Django experience. Um, okay. So we run the time, so that you might give us a bit of background. On okay. Story. Yeah, just let me know. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, when I walk in, I'm particularly strict about this, yeah, whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 So none of that. We don't have that technology. Really like I speak really fast, so I have 300 slides, but they're only up for a half a second. Are you kidding me? No. Yeah, he's totally kidding. Hey, you see that? He's a good one. Wait, so you're on the first time every day. Oh, congratulations. Cool, Ford, good to meet you. Hey, right. So Ford, this is this is Brian. So this is your hey, Brian. co designer. Yeah, likewise. So cool. Alright. You want to test your laptop? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> this is no time like the present. So. You want to yeah, you just, uh, okay, so her, her last name is Nova, and she's like, listen, are you doing uh, what, what, what kind of thing do you want? She's Nicole VGA. I was like, well, I'm not going to go from Max. I think there's way in Mac. It's a serious jump start on my Super Bowl. Good. That's good. I don't know. I think it's a little hard to take this seriously, but it was also a little yeah. They have the, uh, uh, they do? Yeah. 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 So what, the port? You have the, the port is what? The Thunderbolt? No. Oh, it's an older, okay. So Northeast. Yeah, I think it's OG. Well, whatever, they're all there. I have to know they're oh, all minor. We arrive so right, just as, like, a series. You see, uh, Johnson, we actually have higher turnover than the final. It's on. Just have to have a non-joke. Yeah, that's the key. That's the key. Oh, it's a cool thing. Yeah. 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 Oh, and then the house is just going to stop. Yeah, like, this is going. Wow. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So this is a big milestone today for the Django Boston meetup group because we officially had more RSVPs than the Boston Python meetup group tonight. So that's a, that's a cool moment. And uh, I think this is supposed to be on track to be our, our biggest turnout ever, so that's pretty cool as well. Uh, so, but that's all for the media. So that's, that's awesome. Um, so tonight we're going to have two talks on design thinking. Uh, do we have our sponsors? Your sponsor is one. Yep. Okay. So, yeah, you want to get up real quick? Sure. Sort of say what? Or yeah, let, let's do that now. I just want to make sure you have like sort of everybody in the room. So maybe maybe we should do that after every sure. sort of So uh, cool. Yeah. So and it looks like two, <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, so we'll, we'll run through real quick. And traditionally, what we do at the beginning of all these meetups is everybody will go through. Uh, say your name, uh, where you work, uh, what your interest in Django is. It's just really quick. Uh, just so everybody has a sense for what's going on in the community, and uh, yeah, and then we'll have a quick message from sponsors, and then over to our two speakers this evening on this side. Uh, Nick, you got anything? Um, thanks again to our sponsor of the space, Akamai. Yep. As always, we really appreciate that. Space. Yeah. And I, I'll just mention that our speakers tonight is a little bit atypical. It's, they're not going to be talking about gender. They're going to be talking about um, user experience, design thinking, and um, start thinking now. What are the questions that you want to ask a designer? You could ask a designer anything. Like what would it be? These guys are are both. I've been working with Brian and I and I know for from many years, and these guys are real professionals and work with a lot of developers, so um, it's a real treat to have them here tonight uh, for a little something different. So, right. Yeah, and, and we want, like, you know, they'll, they'll, uh, both Brian and Four will give a, a you know, 20, 25 minute talk, uh, and then for the questions, you know, because of the, sort of the nature of the beast, uh, I think it'll be a format, you know, if, if we're more conversational, I think it'll work really well. So, uh, yeah, so it's, it's a little different, but we'll, we'll give it a shot and see how it works. But, okay, so actually it looks like, John, I think we should sponsor stuff now. I think we're, we're yeah. uh, Mike, did you want to say a few words? Sure. Yeah, yeah cool. Actually. cool. <clears throat> Welcome, everybody. I'm Mike McLaughlin. I, I work at Akamai. I'm in the recruiting department, so we sponsor a lot of meetups, and uh, this is probably my favorite meetup group that, that we work with. It's always a good crowd, and, uh, and everybody's really nice. So so welcome to Akamai. Um, this is not our normal meeting site. We generally meet over at HCC, but um, they're doing some work over there. So I think everybody's kind of found their way around, but the restrooms are down over this way. Food is in the back, and um, we'll have a microphone here in case anybody has any questions and they, they talk softly. Um, but uh, the reason we tend to do these meetups, just keep in mind, is we are hiring a lot. So uh, I've got my business cards in the back if um, if anybody wants to follow up about job openings. Um, we're doing a lot of cool stuff here at Akamai. Uh, a lot of work around video delivery. Um, 
trying to make the internet an instantaneous experience regardless of what device or um, situation you're in uh, trying to access web content and then uh, we're also working in a lot of security. Um, I was just telling John today that we served up in the first three days of the World Cup we served up um, more live video streaming than we did in all of 2010. So the growth of video on the internet is, is it's incredible. So you can only imagine what the video um, content show delivery is going to be like in like 2010, 2020. So um, there's a lot of fun work here. So just keep it in mind. Enjoy the night. Thanks. Uh, yeah, let's, let's give them a round of applause. Um, one thing I forgot to mention is um, we are live streaming the talk tonight from the front row here. And we're also recording it, thanks to Madeline. Um, we're also going to put the video up online. So if, if you fall asleep and you want to watch it later, or you have friends at home that want to watch, um, we'll have it up on YouTube. Um, so when we do get to the Q&A period, uh, we're going to pass around the mic just so that the camera can pick it up so we can hear the questions. Should we pass the mic now and let people just say a little bit yeah, about well, I, we Oh, right, sponsors. sponsors. Yes. Hi, I'm Chris Paul from Inside Squared. We are a three-year-old, 75-person, 16-engineer company. It's about a 10-minute walk over that way. Uh, you are very welcome to come, uh, come join us for afterwards. Uh, we help small companies understand their sales, marketing, and uh, financial and customer service and other kinds of data by pulling data from their SaaS apps and uh, presenting it in our SaaS app uh, with great, great visualizations um, and other analytics to be able to explore their data. Um, we are endeavoring to build the best business intelligence app on the planet that has um, sub-second response, real-time data um, um, that you can wire up to your, your data in uh, less than a day. And we do some analytics that other folks just can't do. So uh, love to, uh, to have you over and talk to you. Uh, we also hired, of course, and uh, love to chat later. See you. Thanks. Cool. Um, so yeah, so now we'll do the, the quick sort of everybody introduces themselves part of the presentation. I won't pass it around the mic just because that'll get awkward, I think. Uh, but so speak up, don't be afraid. None of us bite in here. We're like FIFA. We throw out the biters pretty quickly. So uh, uh, yes, yeah, so we'll start in the back left with the guy who thought he was going to uh, hide in the back there. Hello. Who are you? And then, and then that's the end of the light. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did I catch a big bite? He's not in the way, is he? No. Yeah, you're fine. and uh, Django on my personal projects. 
I'm Erica. I'm a new employee at North Point Digital. Um, and I've never used Django, but I'm looking to learn more about um, front end development. And I'm a big fan of Python. Um, I'm Ilya. I'm helping build a data analysis and visualization platform for biologists using Django at Harvard School of Public Health. Mick Timney, I'm Django Dev and DevOps at Harvard Medical School. Freeman Deutsch, and I'm very interested in Django and learning more about Django. I'm David Quinn. I'm part of a startup called Carbonize, which is a communications platform for real estate developers, and we use GeoDanko. I'm Sarah. I'm a robotics engineer. I would love to learn about the UI design. So. Yeah, uh, shout out. I'm a node developer at Rightco. Uh, here, here mainly for the design part of things. Uh, I'm Juan, and I work in ed tech, and I'm just here to learn Django. I'm Richard. I work at Boston University. I'm a web dev. I'm Will, I'm an engineering intern at Wayfair, and I'm interested in user experience uh, specifically pertaining to data uh, visualization. Hi, I'm Beth, I work for the Public Fair of Business Intelligence and Analytics. Hi, my name is Beth, I'm a developer at Mavi. I'm Steven, I work with Paradise, we're a software service provider for all Wow. I'm Sam, and I also work with Paradise. Hello, my name is Brian Williams. I'm a tech entrepreneur, mobile developer. I am Tosco Lewis, and I work with Zephyr. I'm a front-end developer, and I have a guest with me here, John Sheehan. I'm John, and uh, this is John Sheehan. I'm a web developer, so I'm here. I'm Dave. I just finished my master's in computer science. I work for a job, which is a I'll talk to you later. <laughs> Never say that in public, man. Hey, I'm Russ. I've uh, been a web developer for years. Love Django. Um, work at Grow Labs. Uh, I'm Timothy. Um, I'm a PHP and Android guy, so I don't use Django. But uh, besides him, it's still like a nice. Uh, uh, I'm Devin I'm in for the summer for the Harvard Summer School. Um, and I'm concentrating in computer science. Hi, my, my name is Sandy. I'm currently uh, just in Python for mobile study project. I'm from the US, a uh, graduate student. My name is Victor. I work at Verizon. I build uh, prototypes using a variety of different technologies. My name is Madeline Paul. I work on participatory science and open data. I've played around with Django and want to learn some design. And I'm also recording and hoping to hire someone. Great. I'm Jen O'Neill. I'm a director at Deloitte. I'm. Sorry. My name is Ted. I'm a full stack developer, and I think I have professional aid. I'm TJ, I'm an aspiring Django freelancer, trying to focus on the internet things and web PL. I'm John Paul, and I'm a full stack developer. I'm John Baldwin. I mostly do uh, Rails uh, during the day these days um, at a startup called Fashion Project that is uh, to help nonprofits. But I've got a personal uh, pet project that I work on with Django. Cool. All right. Well, cool. Well, thanks, everybody. So without further ado, we'll pass it. No. Yeah, Max. I I mostly run the Django. No, uh, I count trees uh, with satellites mostly. But that's random. So yeah. Uh, I'm Nate. Uh, I run a, a Django 
Python consulting company here in Boston called Jazz Carta. Uh, we've been doing it for about 10 years. Uh, and lately I'm doing a lot with um, OpenEdX, the online MOOC platform, um, Docker, and most recently doing a lot of video uh, streaming transcoding. Yeah, I think I'm wired. All right, can you guys hear me? Our first speaker tonight is Brian O'Neill from Rhythm Spice. Very uh, glad to have him here. Let's give him a warm welcome. All right, well, thanks for coming out, everybody. We're going to talk a little bit about design thinking today and design. Um, so there's going to be kind of two halves to this, and I'm going to try to uh, rush through this pretty quickly. Uh, the first half is going to be more conceptual, and the second half I'm going to try to give you guys a bunch of stuff that maybe you can walk out with and apply today, because I know people like kind of tactical, hands-on things they can do. So real quickly, uh, my background, um, I, I have two lives. I'm a professional musician, and I'm also a professional uh, designer, a product designer, and user experience consultant in town. Uh, I used to work full-time jobs at a lot of big Lycos and Fidelity and JP Morgan and done a lot of startups and I'm involved with a couple startups now and some freelance music projects uh, as well. Um, those are some of the places I've been so maybe I know some of you from, from those days. Um, so the good news is that all of you guys are already designers and you probably didn't know it and how is that possible? Well if you're doing anything that people are using, you're making choices. So that's kind of the first thing to know is that there's no non-choice. So every choice is a choice, and, and design is really about a collection of all these tiny details and decisions that we make all day. So hopefully we can make you better today. So what's good design? These are some of my, my favorite examples up here. So the first one is the paper towel dispenser. So we all go to the bathroom, and someone innovated and made the little machine that rolls the paper towel thing out, but my favorite one is the one that always has a towel hanging down because you don't have to touch anything and you don't have to interact at all. So when we talk about interaction design and these things, interaction isn't necessarily good. So if you can avoid interaction, that's actually even better. So that's actually my favorite paper towel dispenser. So next time you go into the bathroom, you can think how many things did I have to touch and get my hand, I just washed my hands and now I'm gonna go touch this nasty thing. And little fun trivia fact, the dirtiest thing in the bathroom is actually the air dryers. It's not the uh, hand ones because they blow all the germs around. So that's my little trivia fact for today. The second one is the ATM uh, in the middle there. So how many people have noticed how some ATMs you pull the card out in order to get your cash and other ones they give you the cash and then you say, I'm done with my transaction. So some people finally thought about this and realized we can prevent people from leaving their card in the machine by making them have to get their card out first to retrieve the cash. So again, small detail and not the kind of thing that you might see in a requirements document or you know, you're told to build something. This, this is why it's important to think about usage context when you're developing things. So there's no requirement, it still works, right? You can get your money out after or before the car, but we can, when we can prevent errors and, and prevent failures and services, we wanna do that. We don't wanna error message and nag them with questions. We wanna try to prevent interactions if we can. Uh, third one, Apple is actually not the greatest uh, software company, so before you go and copy their interfaces, um, they're very good at hardware and product design. Software is kind of a little bit iffy. However, Time Machine, I thought, was one of the really great things that they came up with, and why? It has an on and an off button. I don't have to set policies, I don't have to try to remember which files to back up, it just backs up everything, and it kind of seems to know about how often to back it up, and all I know is that I've never had a problem where, oh my god, I didn't have a copy of this thing that I needed. It kind of just works. Is it perfect? It's not perfect. But one of the good things about this is they made good assumptions and they thought about what, what assumptions can we make in the design that are probably right for a lot of our users. And so that's another thing that you guys can take away is, is make good assumptions. Don't necessarily assume that tons of choice is always the best way to proceed. We're not gonna give you anything, we'll just give you all the tools so that you can do whatever you want. But now you just put all the work back on me. It's like, it's, it's our job and your job, if you're not working with the designer, to figure out what the best initial default state is. And the last one here is uh, bank software. So we're gonna talk a little about thinking temporarily, but I don't know if you've ever added a payee. So what do I wanna do? The, the user goal is I want to pay my mom, Rhonda O'Neill, a check for something. So I go in and I go to add account and I type in mom's information, I hit save, and then it goes away. What's wrong with that? I didn't want to create an account. I wanted to send my mom a payment. 
So what should it do? It should focus me on the box and say, would you like to pay your mom? Yes, of course I would. So thinking temporarily about these things, little changes like that. I was so happy when my bill payer came out with that and, and finally they, the next thing after you add the payee was they immediately dropped you uh, in, in the payment box there. So these are little examples of good design. So what's the secret here? Um, take a look at this quote. Maybe you guys have heard this before. <coughs> It's your job to find the problems and to solve them. So I write code too. I'm kind of a, I was a generalist designer, developer, and I've really focused on design in my career, but I believe it's important to understand the materials that we design with. As, and what I've noticed and what I've, when I've thought about this presentation is that when you build stuff, it's very, uh, there's a draw to build. You're engineers and you want to create and you want to write code and you don't want to spend a lot of time thinking about this stuff because you like to build and, and I kind of know what that draw is like too. But really the more you can understand the problems that you need to solve, the better you're going to be at solving them instead of kind of taking guesses and then kind of playing the whole, well, we'll wait, we'll get feedback, we'll just launch the first version and get feedback on it. It's the classic one. No, no one really gets a lot of feedback or they're getting feedback the wrong way. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, the design thinking thing has a couple different definitions. but um, it's kind of a combination of uh, empathy, which is understanding the people that are going to use your service. What are their pains and problems and challenges? Um, creativity, which is the creation part, which is probably where we spend most of our time. And, and the rationality, which, which is often kind of overlooked, but this is like, we're a business, we need to make money, or we're a nonprofit, or we have these goals that we need to do. Successful products bring all three of these things together. So if you're working at a commercial place, you probably need to help your company make money, but users may want to do this other thing that doesn't necessarily go along with that, and we want to create some really creative solutions for those things. So design thinking was a way to kind of bring these three things together. <clears throat> and one of the key things, probably the most important thing that I can talk to you about today is this, the need to rebalance. And, and, so, and by the way, everything I'm telling you today comes from my experience consulting largely with companies that don't have designers. They know they have a problem, and so they bring me in, and I, I end up working largely with product managers and software engineers a lot. And so part of my thing is like I want to help them. I'm teach to fish, right? And not just come in and provide design, but, but kind of change the way people approach these things, especially so you can recognize good design and you can recognize problems. Talking to the people that use your services and discovering the problem, what I call the discovery phase. There's a lot of different words for this and ideation or whatever, but really understanding like what the, the big challenges are is really going to change your perspective on what you're building. It's gonna answer questions. You're gonna think about these real people when you are developing in six months later and you're working on something, you're gonna think about John, the guy that uses your widget to count trees and how like what he really cares about is, you know, like, I don't care how many trees per square foot, I really care about like how close is the nearest city. And so, you know, whatever it may be, you're gonna remember these conversations that you had and you're gonna remember their struggles if you watch them use your product and you're gonna incorporate that learning. And you're gonna question when someone says, let's add this feature that does X. And you're gonna say, John doesn't want that. And I talked to John and I know John and we have an ongoing dialogue and you start to turn this elastic persona as we call it, the guy that kind of, we kind of make up this user who kind of can bend to want any of the features that we've come up with. We, we kind of make him more real. <clears throat> so that brings me to this. I, I really like this quote. We, we probably all know 37 signals. They made base camp and uh, backpack. And I think this is a great thing. Start small and deliver some real value that you've thought through. Don't boil the ocean. <clears throat> so is your app half-assed? Here's the signs of suckage the elastic users. You have technology that you know it's good for something, but you haven't quite figured out what it is, but it's this cool thing. Does, that's not necessarily bad, but you need to change your thinking and start to look for a problem for that. Um, adding more instead of improvement, I hear agile tossed around all the time. It means nothing these days, essentially, and every, most of the places I talk to are doing incremental development clouded under the term agile. They're just breaking off big projects and just lumping on. They're not doing the iteration part of Agile. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, for, especially for engineers, the design model doesn't reflect the real world or it reflects the data model. 
That's another one I see. Is sites, it's a classic sign for me if I understand what the database model looks like and the objects in the system, and I see like one page for each of these objects on the screen, and there's a list view and a detail view and a whatever. It's usually a red flag that something's wrong because most of the time, the data model doesn't make sense. It's an abstraction of the way human beings think about stuff. We think about goals and tasks and activities. I need to change my address. I moved. I want to get you know online statements instead of whatever. We're not thinking about, OK, that's a user record, and the School of Public Health has this system with users in it, and then like, no. It's like, I'm just Brian, and Harvard should know who I am if I go to school there, right? So you're probably thinking, well, that's not my job, and I'm not a designer. But you can be a design thinker. So I can't teach you all of how to be a great product designer today in, in, in 30 minutes. Um, but I can try to hopefully uh, show you different ways to think and approach these problems. Um, and it's not art what we do. It's much closer to science, and there's a little bit of art and, 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 and talent there. But read this quote from Tim Brown. <coughs> I think a lot of people think that there's this genius designer. They think of Apple or they think of the iPod and these things just leap into the minds of designers and they come up with these amazing things. There are occasions where that stuff happens, but a lot of places really rigorously apply some thinking to this process. It's not magic. The design is not a big black magic kind of thing. You can find processes to measure what you're doing and apply your learnings from that and improve. <coughs> if you don't know IDEO, they're a a product design consultancy. They do a lot of non-software uh, products, and, and Tim Brown's the CEO. So start thinking like one of us today, if you can. <laughs> um, <clears throat> some of the core things in the practice of doing design thinking are the part about talking to customers, uh, observing people using your product, if you can. This is a big one. Um, <clears throat> if you have an opportunity to do this, like. There's tons of guidelines on how to run like usability studies. Some of you have probably heard of these before. Uh, there's a scientific method involved in doing that. There's structure. The big one to do there is not to focus on what people say when you're observing them using your product. It's just to watch what they do. There's a big disconnect between what people say and what they do. That was really hard. Or that was really easy. And they just spent 30 minutes trying to check out and buy a CD. But they love your site so much, they don't want to hurt your feelings. But you just watch them suffer. So it's just, you really have to kind of learn to, to really watch people's activities and not focus on what they say when you're doing observation. Um, sketching, which we're going to talk about in a minute, and aligning your ideas with your organization or your business. So whoever's paying your paycheck or the division you work in, or like what are their objectives and how does what you do align with those? That's part of building credibility, and it's keeping your product alive so that it has legs and it can, it can grow and continue. <clears throat> so today. You can, all of you can probably find five people to talk to, to either interview them and start to understand what they do on a regular basis, either about your product or just in general. Like someone said, I don't know what's an example of one of the products I heard in here. Um, there's a video, there's like, ah, what do you tell me? You're a video, you do video. Nope. The, analytics. Set, the analytics thing. So you could try to understand like, who are the consumer your software? What are your problems and what, how are we solving things for you and how are we not solving things for you? And, and keep them talking. Let them take tangents. Use that as kind of a phase to discover. It's, it's not hard to do because all you have to do is keep asking why. And I do this all the time with people. Don't ask yes and no questions. Just keep asking why because you can. everything comes back to food eventually. If, I don't know if you know that whole thing. It all, it all goes back to because you need money and then so that you can eat so that you can live. It all comes back to food in the end, but we call that laddering, and you go up this process, and eventually you kind of land on this nugget, which I would call kind of like a goal, and it's usually kind of intangible, but you kind of, the light will usually go on there, and you'll kind of know like, oh, that's what people are doing, or that's why they're doing this, and, and now you can work your way down and get into the nitty gritty design part about that. <laughs> so from that, when you hear about activities they're doing with your product or, or in their real life, if you're modeling a real life thing and you're bringing it online or something like that for the first time, we want to model those activities. And by model, I really mean write them down. You probably know them as use cases. Um, I usually call them user tasks and, tasks and goals. And I, I mentioned stakeholders are people too. 
uh, as it, when I come into a company, usually I work with engineers to understand technical limitations and requirements. I talk to business stakeholders because I need to understand what's going to be, what's going to allow this thing to float. And then, of course, I talk to end users. And sometimes there's a real diametric opposition going on there. And in the best cases, they all they all line up. So you need to also talk to the stakeholders that you work for. Um, one and one of the problems I, I, I see re regularly with use cases or uh, stories or whatever you want to call them, is that <clears throat> people aren't thinking temporally. They're not oftentimes a use case, right? Like, uh, I need to sign up for the thing. Uh, I need to register for Django Boston. I need to type my phone number in. And then I need to share this thing in order to get a free CD from Brian after the show, or whatever it is. Like, that's a use case. What often happens is, is no one's thinking about what was the context I, that guy was in before he went and did that task? And what might that person want to do after that task? So you have to remember that, that while there are some discrete points where you finish an activity, I'm always thinking about what's the next thing someone might want to do. So that we're not just developing these kind of like artificial chunks that are usually uh, cut up because of technical requirements or scope or whatever it may be, at least know what comes before and after so that you can say, yeah, we built this thing, but it's an island. No one can get to that because there's no form to get to it. So we just created an island, but at least now you know you created an island. So when someone says, we spent two million bucks on that piece of shit and no one uses it, it's like, that's because no one can get to the thing. <laughs> we need to build a bridge in the next sprint in order to get to the thing we just made. And you can start to bring this up. We didn't think temporally about the entire experience. We just cut up an arbitrary slice. So think temporally. Um, <clears throat> define success before you build and then measure that later. What do I mean by that? Let's have a goal. We're doing a redesign or whatever it may be. Let's set some status. Pick a number out of the air. Pick something to get started. We want to see a 20% increase or we're going to change this thing and we want to see 10 more people sign up per day or whatever your metric is, start with a baseline and then do some work on a project and go back and measure it so that you know whether or not you're having an, an effect in a quantitative way. You can get feedback talking to people, qualitative feedback like, oh, I really love the service. Uh, I use it all the time, blah, blah, blah. You can get the quant side, which is the analytics and stats that we often talk about. But you want to try to measure what you're doing so you understand if you're having a positive effect. So a lot of times, again, I come in and it's like, like, is the design good or what's going on? It's like, well, tell me what good is. And you'd be surprised. Like, a lot of times, people cannot actually define to me what success is. So I'm like, well, how good is the design? It's like, I don't know. Like, what do you want people to do with it? Like, let's let's have some boundaries here. It can't just be anything or else it's just my opinion and people think that my opinion matters and it's like I can give you heuristic advice, like best practice advice and lots of assumptions are built into that, but I don't know. So if you don't know, all right, well let's stop and talk about what success is so that we can actually fairly measure what we're doing. <clears throat> Sketching. I know we all like to write, like, I don't really like to write code. I kind of hate it because I'm not good at it. But we can all sketch and one of the things I see happen a lot is it's especially now with all the open source code and there's so much free widgets today, it's that there's a temptation to want to always build stuff and just try it out. So we're going to talk a little about that in a minute. Why is sketching good? Paper and pencils, whiteboards, my particular favorite because I like to do this in teams, usually with product manager and engineer. Anybody can do this. It's not about being free. It's super fast to change your mind. Nobody gets offended if your thing isn't right. You don't have, this is my sketching. This is not pretty, this doesn't look nice. That's not the point. This is to get everybody on the same page together about what we think our problems are and what our solutions is. This is a sign-up wizard for a startup in town called Infinio. They do uh, caching, data, data, uh, data storage offloading, stuff like that. So this is a, a sign-up wizard and so we can work together through the stuff, instead of writing a long requirements document that nobody wants to read, and then you build the whole thing, and they're like, that's not what I meant, and then you're like, you know, I'm sure you've all been there a little bit before. So visual is a much better reference. You get rid of this thing like, that's not what I meant, which usually is because someone didn't write a detailed enough spec, but if they did, no one would want to read it because it'd be 200 pages long. Like, defining the placement of all this stuff in English, it's like, no. Sketch it first, jam these ideas out, create as many as you can. Like, we can all participate in this. You do, you do not need a lot of skill to sketch. And so, 
this brings to the next thing, which is the, the pixels and the beauty and the graphic design and the visuals, which I imagine a lot of you are probably thinking about when you heard about design today. So I do want to give you some tips, and they're free. All right, so here's some tactical stuff. First one, <coughs> copy people's ideas and plugins carefully. What do I mean by this? I often see, like, we'll use this plugin to do this thing because someone already built it. Or look at the way Amazon did it, we'll copy that. Don't assume that someone spent time designing it right just because they put it out there for someone else to use. A lot of times I look at this, it's great, everybody's using it, it doesn't make sense to me. The patterns are off or whatever it may be. I would consider what it looks like and how it works just as much as I would consider the code quality and is there people regularly checking in and working on this project. So copy carefully and, 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 and think about, does this thing really work well? And like, if I use this plugin, is it gonna be easy to make sure I when I think temporarily, like am I creating a silo where it's like, well, we'll use this plugin to do this other service, but it needs its own user account. So they're gonna have to create this account now and you just created this morass of stuff also that you could have this cool island of technology that you needed for free. But if you're thinking temporally, you might start to realize what are the trade-offs from a user experience, uh, user experience standpoint doing that. Uh, the next one is uh, your tutorial. Uh, it's what we call a crutch in the design world. Uh, your little tour that you have in your five page thing. Why is that wrong? <clears throat> it's wrong because it's the right information at the wrong time. So I just logged in and you just told me I need to remember five pages of like of uh, icons or graphics trying to communicate some abstract idea that I don't know because I don't know all the things your product does and I got to remember all these before I go do the thing I wanted to do. So do you really think I'm going to remember all that stuff? It's kind of frustrating because then I'm like, oh, I'm probably going to need to know this stuff, but I'm not going to have to know to get back to that tutorial at the time I need it. So you're actually just frustrating people. So the first thing is to fix the design. And if you really need tutorial or tour stuff, put it in context at the right time. Don't put it all in front and call it a tutorial and manage it as a like help documentation. Not helpful most of the time. So it's, it's generally a sign of a crutch and, and try to avoid them if you can. Uh, next one, this is a classic one for developers that I work with. Context over consistency. Everyone thinks consistency is really good. So here's my thing on this. Consistency is a very good starting point, but it's, you need to know when to break the rule. So, oh, it's a date input, so we should use a date picker in a standard format and you drop it in there. Has anyone ever been to a site where you had to type your birth date in and they used a date picker? It's like, great, it starts at 2014. I was born in 77, so that's uh, 37 clicks back that I have to go and then I gotta find the right month, all because it was consistent and everywhere you go you should be date pickers, right? No, it's like, I just created an arbitrary example. Let's go to dinner. Well, you probably want to go to dinner, maybe tonight or tomorrow, if you're booking your reservation. You know, I'm just making an assumption, maybe open table, most of their reservations are like that. If I found out most of their reservations were all piled up in the next 48 hours, give me a quick way to get right to that stuff and bury the features and other stuff later. So always break the rule if you know that the task will benefit from that. Don't worry about uh, the, the consistency crutch. Um, the next one, uh, <laughs> Fix the product and, and not the training and help. We kind of talked talk about this in the middle. Um, you all remember Clippy, probably from uh, Office 95. Not only not helpful, but it was, an, it was like annoying help. It couldn't get worse than that. It's not only helpful and it's in your face and it's bouncing. It was just absolutely terrible. And why, and why did that come out? Because their product had become such a pile of poop for like, uh, do you remember when there was like 10 menu bars? There must've been like 500 icons on that thing because they had just, they hadn't really designed this thing properly and at some point they actually pulled the plug and the, and the new ribbon style office thing came out and all these people were up in arms because these corporations, all these millions of people in office workspaces had learned all the side tricks and the shortcuts for to work around all this stuff and then they had to break it. I actually think that was the right thing. It's like, we gotta cut our losses because we're just dragging this baggage along, we're creating talking paper clips. It's like, you know, it's, <laughs> you got a problem at that point, so. Uh, next one, um, don't abstract your UI tech too early. So what do I mean by this? Um, I need some widget that does X. And we're probably gonna need this other one that's gonna do something similar, but it's gonna be two people instead of one person. And then there might be this third one there, but we're not sure it's gonna be for guests. But anyhow, so this, this, is, this is a designer talking to you and you're thinking, okay, so we need a user model and we need a whatever thing. 
and so I'm going to create this method that's going to do this abstract blah, blah blah whatever. The problem with that is that most of the time what happens is you you get you abstract this thing to the point where the primary need or use case has kind of the quality has been lost from the experience because your widget now will do a million things instead of just two things. So my rule is kind of like let's wait till we have like two, three, four instances of something before we start to like abstract it or 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 kind of force you force the designer, I'm kind of thinking now in the role as a front-end developer, because I like to design in the pixels in the front-end with data, don't, don't force me into that stuff too early. Let's wait and get it right before we kind of like make the code perfect, because the time it might take you to rewrite it may not be that long. So you have to kind of make that trade-off between uh, quality uh, and great code. So we talked about this one a little bit easier. Um, does everybody know what a, a mental model is? So a mental model is the way um, people perceive your site to be. Like a, a great example of a mental model you all know is the subway maps. So you're notice that all subway maps go up, down, or at 45, 45 degree angles. You'll never actually see a subway map laid out the actual way it looks on a real map because our model tends to be that directions are either perfectly up and down, right to left, or at an X. So you'll always see subway maps laid out because that's our mental model of it. It's not actually real. So another example of this is, again, like a, a, if you work at a company that does acquisitions or a big college, you might have there might be you know 50 applications that actually have a Brian O'Neill like a user table in it that has my record in it. But for me, I'm just Brian O'Neill and I have an ID and. You should know where that. I don't know where your stuff is. I just I'm Brian O'Neill, and you should know where I am. If I move, I want to get. I want to type my address in one time and give you my new address. I don't want to go to 50 places to do that. So that's my mental model. Is that I, it's just me. Your model is wow. We have 50 services to sync up and blah 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 blah. So think about that. Data model not equal to mental model. And the way to keep doing that is to remember verbs, tasks, activities. You're thinking about people's needs. You're not thinking about objects and records and nouns and when, and this is kind of it's a little bit abstract but the more you're constantly remembering about tasks and goals and, and activities the more you can make sure you're not uh, you're not going uh, off the deep end or, or you're going to lose people from an experience standpoint um, minimize registration questions so sign up forms uh, you should be giving value if you're going to ask for my email or my zip code or whatever it may be. It's okay to ask for it, but generally speaking, the less stuff you ask for, the more completions you're going to have. And there's also this concept of distributed registration. So let's say you really need people's gender, for example. You don't necessarily have to collect gender at sign up. You can do, like you've seen the LinkedIn profile, your LinkedIn profile is 92%. And now they've actually kind of almost create like a game or a system that kind of makes you feel 92, come on, I can get 8%. Like you kind of want to fill it out now. Um, however you do that, whether you give value or you gamify it or whatever, unless you really need that data for, for some business reason, and it's usually a business, a marketer wants the location data or whatever it may be, I'd really push back and try to minimize uh, setup and registration, especially on mobile. Um, next one, um, agile is, not necessarily agile, I think we ship a lot more code, but the spirit of agile has largely been lost. Um, so my thing is if you work at a company with this stuff, I've seen every version of agile, mostly scrum these days. It doesn't matter what you call, it doesn't matter what the rules are, I don't believe in like these clinics where you get certified in agile. Find a process that works for you, but remember the agility part. It's about fast, but it's also about iteration. It's about quality, shipping stuff sooner, less documentation, talking to people, having a real user involved with that stuff. That stuff matters, and, and that tends to get pushed off. It's really become more like, let's just do two-week coding projects and ship them out the door and call it Agile. So there's more to the manifesto than, than just shipping code regularly. <clears throat> um, mobile, I didn't have time to do some visual uh, samples of this, but just some quick little tidbits. Um, when you're filling out forms, Try to avoid changing the input context. So what do I mean? There's a, a phone number dial thing, and then I hit next, and now I'm in a spinner. And then I go back to a full keyboard, and then I go to this other thing. If you can avoid this thing where the UI is bouncing around because it's pulling up the proper keyboard or input method, that's generally really good. And, and I've seen some, uh, a really good example of someone doing this well is the square card reader, the credit card reader. Um, if you go to that, when you type your, your, uh, the numbers in, 
it just all the numbers are in one row. You type the card number in, and then you type in the security code, and it's one input. There's no bouncing around. It just slides the cursor over because we all have typed in those numbers a million times, and we know how to type our birthday, and we know these these the, these things. So just it's a great example of just a nice seamless experience. There's no bouncing UIs and this, you know the pages scrolling and all this kind of stuff. So next one is use big tap targets when you can. If you can remove some buttons or, or favor the, the popular choices in your app, that's good. And keep the tap targets big so it's fast. Um, another one is uh, that I've seen sometimes is uh, you're, you didn't think about someone actually having their hand on the device. And so when they type something in or they did something, the feedback is appearing under their hands. So then you have this thing where it's like, oh, did it do, did it do anything? Like, you're not sure, and you're kind of getting that frustration because there's, there's, no, there's been no feedback, as we call it, in the design world. So watch for where the feedback is going to land. Um, context, don't forget offline usage. Don't forget about outside. Don't forget about lighting. Think about these things in, in the mobile context because they, they may affect your design. And, and again, do a few things well. Start small. Uh, next one, someone said they were into data visualization. I like that kind of stuff. Here's my first rule of data visualization. <coughs> These graphs are identical in terms of data density. They tell the same story. This one is about eight times as big. So why should I, why should I fill up 20% of the screen with that chart? Like most, well, because I can really see that there's actually a little dip right here. The chart is not to go figure out what was the precise value of X at this time. The chart is what is the trend over time of this thing? And if the spark line, which is, these are sometimes called spark lines, these little small data graphics, can convey the same information. And this is especially true if you're doing like a dashboard or something that people look at regularly where they can start to know what the expected shape is. Keep them small. Shrink your graphics. Most of the time, like at least half, the gra most of the graphs I see could be shrunk in half and carry the same amount of uh, data density in them. So shrink, shrink, shrink if you can. Uh, next one. This is also from a, my, the client of mine, Infinio. So, um, so real quick, so you can understand this thing. Um, in order to offload storage, they they have RAM, uh, a RAM cache. So when requests come into a data center uh, for read heavy, like analytics, where you're pulling data, they hold all this stuff in the cache, and they can say, oh, you don't need to go to disk for that. We're going to serve it out of RAM, and it goes back. So that the effect of this is you're offloading IOPS from storage. So. The product, the business, wanted to show on the dashboard, well, we want to show people how much it's doing, like how good our product is, how much is it offloading. So they're like, oh, we can count the IOPS that were offloaded, right? 64,000 IOPS were offloaded from your storage. That's great. As compared to what? What does that mean? I can't, is that, how many donuts is that? Like what, I need to feel what that is. And so I said, why don't we figure out what, how much a regular disk drive costs and how much you can do and, and count it in disk drives. So now it's like, oh, I can get my head around that. That's like two shells of disk. That's, see, that's $30,000 in NetApp storage. So we just save $30,000 a month with this product. Now, yeah, the engineer might say, well, it depends on if it's SSD or it's a SATA drive or blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and you can put a calculator or whatever. It doesn't matter because it doesn't have to be exact. And, and the, first, the, the person that uses this is going to know, like, you, OK, well, what, how much did you charge for the drive? And, but they're also going to be like, oh, that's kind of cool. I can, I can tell my boss that. And that's why this is actually in here. It's not so much that the, the operations guy in the data center might like that. It's more that he can give his boss something, ammunition, to make a decision to say, you should buy this product. We say 21 disks. That's like half of the disk we have all now. It's like, because and the, and the, the CIO probably has no idea what a disk is. So he needs to relate that up in a way that can be understood. <clears throat> so. So my, the, the other thing with this, the, the previous slide here, as compared to what, the big, a big flag for me is when someone says, oh, we want to have an analytic or something, like uh, there are 123 widgets. The first thing I ask is, as compared to what? Like historical number of widgets that have changed, or the average widgets, or everyone else's widget count, or whatever it may be. Most of the time, you need some extra data near that number so that 123 actually has some meaning. So otherwise, unless people really know what this stuff means, it, 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 it's out of context. So you need to provide something. And, and asking the question as compared to what is kind of my like little rule of thumb when I see magic numbers, as I like to call them on the screen. That's a, 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 an Edward Tufte thing. T-U-F-T-E is an author. He's a data visualization uh, scientist at, at Yale. He's written great books. So I would definitely check him out if you're in the data biz space. 
Um, another tip, uh, compact and denoise your tables. So what do I mean by noise? This is also a, a tough deism. Uh, what we call non-data ink and data ink. So do you see this blue shading here and the white stripes here and the, the negative space that's created next to the question mark and the word citrus? <coughs> this area in here, all of this is non-data ink. That's designer talk for you. It's unnecessary ink on the screen that's not helping you do anything. It's not conveying any information. So one of the first things I do if I sit looking at lots of data tables or charts, charts is another one, like charts that have black, uh, the, the, uh, the amount or the temporal scale, everything's written in black. The first thing I go do is cut everything down in half opacity wise to, to light gray. I almost go to invisible and I take all the striping and all the crap out of there and I start with nothing because you can actually, this is the same data and how, what is that, a 30% reduction in the real estate? So we can increase the data density without confusing the design. And it's, it's not to say that borders and shading are never needed, but a lot of times there's just way too much non-data ink on the page that's not necessary. So try to use the invisible grid lines that are here that are naturally created by alignment. If you can uh, try to go, uh, do y'all you, you know what I mean by grid? So a lot of times designers design on grids that are like you know 16 pixels this way and 16 this way, and they try to align everything on this imaginary grid that you don't usually see. You might see it in Photoshop when they're doing comps, and you, maybe you've seen a spec with redlining about all the spacing. That stuff matters, and it, it helps us not have to do all of this crazy striping and bordering and shading and gradients and all this crap, because that, that might be fine for like a dash, like if this is the only statistic on the dashboard, but if you've got 50 of these, that's a lot of non-data ink. It's a lot of noise to sift through on the screen. So try to reduce that stuff. <clears throat> Next one, to clarify, you add data. So this information overload thing is kind of a farce. The problem is not information overload, it's undesigned information. Information you can't draw conclusions from. The stats aren't necessarily the bad stuff. So this is another storage product I worked on. You don't really need to understand everything that's going on here. But in short, the, the name of the thing is top five virtual machines that are in trouble right now. And so when I came in, it's like, what did I see? Data, the, the data model was the system. So I can click on a VM and then I get CPU, memory, storage, network. And then I can look at the CPU thing. Oh, look at all the charts there. It doesn't tell me why Oracle Data Mart is like down right now and I'm getting 50,000 phone calls and like I'm gonna lose my job. It did no analytics at all. It was just a, what we call a metrics toilet. It's just tons of numbers and charts with no conclusions. No one thought about how I might need to do that to do my job. And our job was help IT admins never have to get a phone call because everything just works magically and they're in the basement doing their thing. That's really what, that's what their whole job is about is avoiding uh, crazy stuff. So we're like, well, why don't we put the charts up about what's going on? The charts give us context, right? Last six, the first thing we heard was like, well, I want to know what happened. So like in the last, you know, two days, three days, what was going on? But then the next thing was like, well, is that normal? Because some of our systems run backups at two in the morning. So the six week chart gave us context to say, that's abnormal. Like this, this, this event should not happen. Like we look at this curve, there's a pattern here over the six weeks. So now I know that this is the data is telling me that this is actually abnormal, it shouldn't be happening. And then we, we made the software go and figure out, well, what might be responsible for that? The OS is at 95 and it's paging or whatever it may be. The software drew those conclusions for us. So can they drill down and get more data? Yes, but that's all tool time. I don't want to spend my time looking at CPU and then look at the network and then try to remember how the shape went because I really needed the charts lined up on the timeline, but I didn't have the right stuff. That's all what we call tool time. I don't want to do tool time when I'm about to lose my job. I want to know what's wrong with it. I want to know, okay, we have an OS utilization, maybe a process is crazy. Now, I don't have to do any drilling. I can go right to the guy that owns that Exchange server and tell him, something's going on with your CPU. Can you please check out what's going on because you're totally screwing us, blah, 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 whatever it may be. So add data to clarify. Don't make me go drill in and you know do all that stuff. So <clears throat> getting to the end here. This is really true. Charles Eames was a furniture designer. You've probably sat in his chairs and seen them quite a bit. Um, the details are the design. The sum of all of these little, like the non-data ink and the border striping and stuff I was talking about, it's not just that that one table needs to be fixed. It's the sum of all of these little tiny nits. So if you've ever worked with a designer, like, could you move it up four pixels? And could you like just change the shading? And, and you're like, 
<laughs> I'm sure you've all been there. No one likes to do that stuff. But the reality is, is the sum of all of those tiny nits is what makes things magical and special. It's the products that you were, God, I knew that I, that's so awesome. It knew that I was going to go here. It's like, it, oh, it, it knows I'm home. And it's like, it says, are you home now? We'd like to turn the lights on for you. Because someone thought through that experience, a little tiny, yeah, you can always say I'm home and hit the button, but it's kind of nice that it asked me that question. So these details matter. So that's my quick thing. I hope I didn't go over I don't know what the time was when we started. But if you have any questions, uh, my email's up there. I'm on Twitter. I'm also a musician, so if you like music, you can check out my band, Mr. Ho's Orchestratica. A little plug there. And uh, thanks to Nate and Max and John. And so we, we are a little over, so we're going to move directly into. All right, let's do it. Into, uh, Actually, uh, maybe while we'll, we're setting up on the, uh, the presentation, we can maybe do a question or two. So. <laughs> yeah, there's just an on-off on there. I think it's really bad to hear. Sure. Mm -hmm. Do you want to do questions while he's getting ready? Yeah. Sure. All right. So, your take on CAPTCHAs. Can you get the mic? What's that? CAPTCHAs. I read an interest. There was a great t TED talk about the... Oh, you probably don't need that now. I probably do. Yeah. Um, I don't... Uh, this on? Hello? Okay, CAPTCHAs. Um, I haven't had to deal with uh, a capture in a while, so I don't really have an opinion on them. I know there's a lot of plugins for these. I did, there was an interesting talk about how they're, I guess they're uh, trying to scan all the books, and they're taking, the captures you see are actually coming out of uh, scan pages from books that they want to uh, digitally encode the real words in books. And so they actually use, you all are participating when you fill out captures and recording the books. So that's my little trivia fact. Um, if you're going to use a plugin, uh, one, we did talk about accessibility, um, but that's one thing to keep, to keep in mind. Um, people that have impairments. So visual impairments, we tend to think of blind people, but there's also partially uh, partial vision loss. Uh, there's learning disabilities. There's people with motor impairments. There's other uh, a variety of different um, disabilities that we need to consider with that. So the blind one obviously being a, a good example. If you can't see, and they're intentionally making it hard to read this thing so you don't get spam, how do you get past one of these things? So that's why a lot of them have the little audio uh, player on them now. That's for people that can't see. So I would minimally make sure that it's not too difficult to read and that there's an accessible option that goes with that if you're going to use one. So I, I generally would try not to have them. I, on my personal website, I just have five times two. I always put a little math question. Uh, I've also seen one like, which one is not a dog? You know, so you can have fun with it too. It doesn't necessarily have to be some squiggly, squiggly letter. So like, I think game sites could maybe have a little fun time with it or something like that. We didn't really talk about fun, but that's another thing. Fun is okay. Fun is okay in business software. It's, it's okay in personal consumer software. Don't underestimate the value of just of, of adding some pleasure to people's lives on a daily basis if there's a little place to do that. So, um, any other questions why he's getting set up? Um, yeah. So, <clears throat> you're talking about observation. I was wondering if you had any like, tips about how to get more of it or like... If you had how to get more observation? Yeah. Do you mean opportunities to get to do it? Opportunities or tools or anything like that. Um, yes, so <laughs> recruiting tends to take time, but it's kind of an investment you can make up front. So. Um, finding people is one of the hardest things, and finding the right user, sometimes you're really far from them. So I usually go to salespeople, if you're in a, if you're in a commercial place, the salespeople usually know that, and they will freak out the first time you want to do this, because they are so careful about who gets to talk to the customer. But if you start doing it in the right way, they will find out that their customers love this stuff, because it's like, here's an hour, this guy's not selling me anything, and all I get to do is tell him about my problems. It's like free psychology. So you'll actually usually find the users love it and the sale guy love it because his customers have, is like, God, they come in and listen to me bitch about their product, that's great. So it takes time to build up that stable of, of users, but you can usually go back to the, you know, keep going back to them. You, you wanna have enough that you're not constantly talking to the same people at the same time. Um, there is like usertesting.com, there's some online services for these, but I generally don't go for more Go for a few and your personal engagement with that. It's really important to have that face-to-face -face if you can. I know sometimes they don't, you know, I'm the same state or whatever, but that personal interaction is actually, it's, it's really powerful and it will really change your perspective. I've, I've seen rooms of engineers watching someone use the thing they built 
and watching them either suffer through it or like be, this is so freaking cool. And it really changes the engineer's perspective on stuff. And they'll also say like, you know what? I'm not going to work on that because that thing works really well. We tested that last week. That guy loves that thing. And there's video to prove it. And you can start to like not just be the one that has to code whatever someone else told you to build. You have some ground to stand on about that. So <clears throat> just holler when you're yeah. ready or you good, unless yeah. you're good. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, Any suggestions for resources for, for lack of a better term, developing a better aesthetic sense? I mean, for example, I found, one of the things I found really remarkable about your, your talk or your slides is you made really effective use of three colors, and it worked really well. And if I had designed those slides, it would have been way more complicated. <laughs> Like, yeah. what's a good resource it, for that kind of thing? I, I'm still learning. Like, I would say graphic design is the thing I have the least training. I mean, I have a music degree, so I'm still learning these things, too. And, and my strategy, as with playing jazz, is to copy people that are better than I am. So I will look at someone else's thing and maybe change it a little bit. But over time, through the process of copying, I can learn why did they do it that way. And so doing is one of the best ways. There's also some free sites that have like color palettes where you can choose a collection of colors, like three or four, and they're good combinations. In fact, they have names and the, you know, the designers get ranked by most popular palette for the summer. Um, those are another great way to start with that and, and use those colors. Um, I also tried to reduce the number of fonts. So there were only three different font faces in that whole thing, and three's already pushing it. To start with as few choices as you can and try to work with that. Um, usually it's the problem comes when you start adding bolding, italics, color, sizes. You have too many things going on and it actually adds noise. So, you know, it, but it, it takes time and it's, it's, I don't have a really quick answer for that, but doing is probably the best way to learn about that um, or taking a graphic design course or something like that. So, um, yeah, we think good. Yeah, I'll get to you. Uh, sort of banking off that, do you think that uh, flat design is like, Bad, or do you think that's something that's going to ground? Or I, I usually do don't get too stuff? hung up on these things about which, uh, usually the problems are so much bigger that I'm looking at. It's like, yeah, it's a flat button, but it's like, again, you, it's, it's on an island that no one's able to get to. You have such bigger problems than whether it's flat or not. Um, generally speaking, I like uh, minimal design, and this is another point I should have put in the slide, which is the, the invisible interface. So if you're doing a good job with your product, no one really noticed your interface. That's actually a really good thing. It's just, like, could you remember, like, I, I know OpenTable is red, and I use it to book stuff, but I couldn't tell you what their interface looks like. I just know that, like, the times are there, and it's easy to find the stuff, and when I want to book a table, I go to OpenTable. I don't really know what it's like. Now, Waze, the driving app, I can tell you what that looks like. That's a great example of, of non-data ink galore. There is so much friggin' noise on that thing. If you look at the saturation of color, the really heavy colors, big thick lines, these kind of goofy icons and stuff, and then go look at like Google Maps and look, just look at the street view, pull up the same thing, you'll notice the colors are reduced. You'll notice how much more gray there is in the Google version of that because all every street and every building, all that, that's noise. Your driving route is the signal that you want to stand out. So if you've got black roads everywhere and then a big purple thing over it, there's a lot of noise to compete with with that. So I'm kind of like whatever, whether it's flat or not, I'm kind of like which one has the strongest signal. Um, I, I generally, I like the flat thing. I think the beveling and, and, and the skeuomorphism is the technical word for when you, know, you have the leather bound iCal. Uh, when you when you bring real world concepts into software, the guy actually got booted out of Apple, or there was a big fight about that, and that's why everything went away. He was kind of the evangelist for that, uh, and there was also a general thinking that you know people finally understand this new medium of tactile text, so we don't need to carry through these these physical world metaphors anymore, and so they've kind of gone to more of this minimal interface, which which I really like, like the charts that you saw up there with the the red and green dots, and the CPU is over, like. You couldn't really remember what the borders looked like or whatever. You just saw the charts and the, the statistics and the red to tell me that something was wrong. And I mean, I, I imagine most of you probably don't know what the color was of the label that of the header for that component. It was green on gray background, but you didn't really see it. So that's kind of my thing. Is that's not necessarily bad or good, but I do like to reduce, uh, you know, stuff. So my general thing is start. I guess I kind of have always been sort of a flat fanatic. Um, I like some gradients here and there can actually help with some things uh, sometimes as well, but I don't feel like a button necessarily has to be hugely beveled, but you also need to watch out that it doesn't look like a rectangle 
that, that doesn't look like it's clickable, we call that an affordance. So the affordance means like, oh, I know that's a button and it's clickable, or a blue hyperlink. The affordance tells me that there's an interactivity there. So you want to watch out that you're not so minimal that you don't know that there's any interactivity there, because now you have a usability problem. So I don't know if that's <laughs> answered your question or not. But yeah. Oh, wait, no. Over here. Is there one? Are you ready, uh, Four? Probably one more question. Okay. So my question is, um, if you do work in, a, in an environment where uh, uh, sprints are every week, uh -huh. every week um, what are the most potent activities, new activities you can conduct to be true to design thinking and yet stay in patient? So usually what I, what I do with, with Agile is I like to call what's building the runway. And so when I come in, I usually like to do some projects that aren't necessarily going to be part of the scrum. And you may think, oh, this is waterfall. But the zero sprint is the design sprint, so to speak. I want to build up a queue of code-ready design work. It's been tested. It's validated. We love the design. And when you guys have time to build it, you can build it. Now, what's probably going to happen is there's going to be problems with the design when you get into the, into the sprint. You're going to say, oh my god, we can't bite all this off. We love it, but it's too much or whatever. What I usually do then is say, okay, whenever that happens, the designers or me will stop work on our future sprint, because remember, we're now ahead of you. We built a runway up for the engineering. We'll stop work on that. We always come back to the current sprint. That always takes priority. We do some negotiation. Maybe we cut some features out, stuff like that. That's kind of how I usually manage the, 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 the tight time boxing that comes with, with that. Um, Agile doesn't allow for a lot of st uh, stuff if your company is not doing iteration and actually validating that the design work and revisiting the thing that you shipped out like oh it's good enough just get it out because we have this next thing coming up that's a classic sign you're not really doing agile you're really just doing waterfall in small increments now it doesn't mean agile is necessarily bad again i don't care what it's called i, I do like agility so whatever your process is i like measuring what you're doing and knowing what you're doing and not just shipping out small amounts of stuff constantly and just adding to this pile because that's called baggage or code spaghetti as you know you're now carrying along this huge thing behind you which means if there's a monumental user experience problem it's going to be really friggin expensive to fix it and no one's going to want to touch that so by measuring along the way you de-risk your code you de-risk the product and but it takes you know it, it it's a cultural change that sometimes has to happen if you're used to this, you know, every week codes flying out the door and, you know, oh, we added something, you know. <laughs> so, we're cool. are we uh, still yeah. ready to go? Yeah, we're, we're, yeah. Okay, so yeah. here's the mic. Uh, <clears throat> cool. cool. Thank you. All right, so now on to four. So, is your microphone? There you go. How's that? Perfect. All right, uh, bear with me, please. Hughes. I'm a product designer and user experience designer. Uh, this is a, you guys are my alpha testers for this lecture. Uh, my background is in symbolic systems and cognitive science, architecture, and craft. Uh, that includes cabinet making, textile design, user experience design and uh, some industrial design. And uh, Ryan focused very much on the user experience, the experience on the screen, and what I'm going to hopefully put you in mind of is what's going on in the designer's mind when you walk into their office or when you see what they're doing. So this is not about user experience design production process so much as what the hell's inside that guy's head. And because my background is in three dimensions, 
my background is mostly in three-dimensional design, not graphic design, and so that's going to be my focus. And I also choose that because it gets us away from the two-dimensional world that we live in every day in our product development. And since I want to break you out of uh, the head that you're in when you're thinking like a software designer, we're going to go into the 3D world. Now, we don't have the objects here, so we will, of course, be using visuals. And if we can get the system to work, I will show about a 10-minute film but to see how things go with that. <clears throat> and uh, as you can see, I'm not a keynote jockey, so bear with me, please. <clears throat> so, some of these examples will be architectural, but the point here is to look at these forms, the function of which is not immediately evident and not, this is not a quiz, can you tell me why they did it that way, but it's an opportunity to ask yourself, how did the designer get to this? And they probably had a brief, which was, you know, a municipal opera house on the water with a certain capacity and a certain number of performance spaces, and they're an opera house, performance space, performance hall could make many forms, so somehow their thinking arrived at this. Now, as it happens, in this particular case, so the story goes, the architect was looking at a sliced orange one day and saw the slices of an orange as pieces of a sphere and then saw them as possible structural elements in his design. So there's a great distance traveled between the original inspiration for the shapes and their ultimate use, which of course includes utility. All of what we do when we're designing software includes utility, and so I want us to think about the distance between the orange peel and the opera house roof that isn't just about utility. This is a sketch by an architect of another architect's work. Are you trying maximizing that window? Yeah, yeah. I'd like to do that. You play. <coughs> We're left. Um, uh, Is the problem that it's showing on the laptop screen instead of on the projector screen? Uh, Mike. Here we go. There we go. All right. Problem is, I'm out of practice with the screen. So here is sketching of one architect examining the work of another. An exploratory process, as Brian mentioned. And don't look here for a linear connection between these sketch diagrams, but see them as explorations very close to doodles in which light and dark, foreground and background are explored on the way to conceiving a three-dimensional volume. <coughs> Here's another exploration 
of the, ultimately the same volume. The black, of course, is the walls, but more specifically, this is the mass. So this is an exploration of shape and mass and space. And here is a sketch of the building when it was completed. Here is an element of the building. Notice that its use is pretty evident immediately, but that it has very strong sculptural form. So again, the architect explores through sculpture to find utility. So this is, I'm talking about the very non-linear path that design takes as it explores shapes and in the case of three, dimen three dimensions, space, solid and mass. This is inside the building and we, you could describe this to someone who came back from France. Well, there's a big hollow tower at the end of the chapel and of clear glass, the panes were all the same size, they were elongated. There's a long slot at the top, but ultimately the experience is really light, not so much function in the, let's say, a more dry sense. Yes, it's the tower of the chapel, but as we look up in a sacred space, whether it's our own religion or not, and think about transformation, the idea of heaven, the idea of moving outside of our world, interior and exterior, lightness and the heaviness of earth, as it's described. The architect has created experience by the use of materials and shape and mass and volume. So while the client's brief was to take the certain site, wooded site, and to build a memorial chapel of a certain size, <coughs> other the architect proceeds through other issues and other aspects of the font what will be the final experience to arrive at this shape. Here's a scale correct drawing. It wouldn't be quite accurate to compare this to a wire frame just because they're both precisely drawn, but you can see here again how they're, this is a tool for exploring the seams of the concrete floor are very specifically chosen with this irregularity. And the weights of the walls vary. So exploration is not necessarily vague. The designer is not necessarily wandering around in haze. That's not creativity. They are going into spiff the we, I would go into specific detail. You may go into specific detail and then to broader aspects of mass or foreground and background. <coughs> this is a wall here with openings. <coughs> capturing essentially the dimensions and the shape, but this is what it looks like. So uh, a designer comes to uh, a user experience brief and is wondering needs to get beyond whether it's a drop-down. needs to get beyond the transition of the swipe 
from one screen to another on the phone and is asking themselves when I'm, when the user is in the process or put the phone back in their pocket, what would they say about what happened? Not you know, like, there was a 44 pixel touch spot and then I moved my wrist to the left and I was able to give my credentials. But the designer is thinking about the experience of, let's say, in this case, mobile device, the, uh, I came out of the subway and I knew my aunt's apartment was somewhere around here and I could remember it was a building that stepped back. That's the search in the user's mind and how can I elicit something on this little screen with the user interface elements I have to make a connection between that thought process and what we can do on the screen so that the designer is reaching across the mental experience and the screen, ultimately the product on the screen, and trying to connect the person who has a need or the person who's coming with certain assumptions to their final product design. So here we have a really thick concrete wall facing south on a field in France with a bunch of wooden benches and some colored glass. But we can see that that's not, it doesn't say enough to capture what will happen when we're in here. And a cloud moves from obscuring the sun and suddenly these are lit up bathing us in white and colored light with the un echoes that we're not used to in our usual buildings rolling around our ears. <clears throat> uh, software is happens across time, unlike an object that we might hold in our hand. And that gives the designer and the programmer a different kind of opportunity from a three-dimensional object. This is a painting in the cubist style, it's a detail of a painting called New Descending a Staircase. So, but this is not an art history lecture, but imagine how this could be a new descending staircase. I'm not even gonna show you, show you the whole image. The artist sees a, in this case, a woman posed on stairs in the studio and has all the images of a person has of people going downstairs and needs to reach across that experience that's in front of him and create something on the canvas which conveys motion of, through time and the changing light on the flesh of the model as they move down the stairs. So, Again, what I'm showing this to hopefully break your mind into an exploratory mode and to see something which is not descriptive in the typical sense and to work your imagination to see how this image could come from that from a nude posed on the staircase. This is the tower at Ronchon, and of course the downspout. This is an image that's closer to what our experience is of an object, in this case architecture, than 
uh, posed photograph that encompasses the whole building. So, uh, designer of a digital product has understands that there are moments across the experience of the product that are like this. That in the, that that have each of us could put a caption on this or write a tell a story about what's happening to the person with this picture. So there's connotation that we add to the experiences we have and the images we see, and we extrapolate from details to the whole. So in all these ways, we are thinking about more broadly than I'm going to have a infinite scrolling list of a certain font size, and each of them is going to be a link to a detail screen. I chose this picture just because it shows the form very strongly. size bronze casting. So again, here the sculptor recognizes the human form and then uses surfaces, planes, <coughs> shadow, proportion, the cant of the bot of the cant to show forward motion, but destroys the forms we expect to see too with these irregular and non-human shapes. But when we look at it, we can recognize a human form and we can imagine the motion and we can recognize what the parts of the body are. So This is another example of some of the designer, the artist, who's crossed the space between the nude posed in the studio and the bronze and then the mind of the viewer. sketch of an architect exploring form. So I'm going to see if I can get this full uh, mood to work for us. Yeah, actually, uh, before yep. we do the video, just because we're getting a little past our usual bedtime yep. here, um, could we maybe finish up the, the rest of the, uh, the uh, slide presentation? Then That's it. Okay, perfect. Um, so, yeah, just because like it's, uh, you know, people need to head out. Okay. This is many time to sort of take a little, little break. Maybe ask some questions. If we want to take a that break. That's great. Yep. Okay. Uh, hey, what, what is the video? Just this is. This? Well, I actually don't want to tell you, but it's about <laughs> ten minutes long. Okay. Perfect. Well, cool. So now, uh, just yeah, wanted to put a little break here because we are going a little longer than usual, so people can stay. Uh, want to stay and, and watch this, and if not, then that's, this is a good point to uh, how, about, how about the book raffle? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is book raffle? That is true. Yeah, how many books do we have? We have four and two e-books. Four and two e-books? Yeah. Do we have more than six people who want books? Raise your hand if you want a book. <clears throat> Where are they? Yeah, yeah, right. books right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I was wondering if there's any way we can do that simultaneous 
with the video is to be most efficient with frequency. Oh, I thought we were going to take uh, a break. Yeah, okay. Yeah, tell you what, let's take a, let's take a five minute break then. We'll do the book raffle, and then we'll start up the video, and then uh, that's tonight. So, does um, our sponsor from Inside Square want to give directions on where the beer yes. is going to happen? Yeah, um, probably the best is follow me. I can give you my address on the business card, uh, but maybe we'll, you know, can you write it, can you write it up on that? Sure. It's 160, 160 seconds. Turn on the lights here for a second just as we do the book wrap or whatever. Yeah, but I have a pen. Is there a pen up on the podium? Yeah. Cool. So, done one. Should we get 10 choices? 160 seconds. All right, set. What's pointer number one? Sorry. Chris. Actually, which court? Just one. Just one floor? Oh, we're, we're on the third floor. There will be a sign eventually that will point in the right direction when I get there. Okay, great. Um, but if you'd like to grab a card and you can call me when you get there, if, there's any, if you have any problems. How did you want to do All right. Far away? Actually, just to get a sense, how many people here are programmers and how many are like design type people? So programmers first. Okay, design people. Gotcha. Cool. Anybody doesn't do? How about Peter Agakura? Gakuru. Peter? You have once? Go. Okay. Okay. Next. Tom L. Tom, like Tom L. Negative. Okay. Negative. Next. Okay. Next. Charles. Do we have a Charles? Anyone named Charles? <laughs> okay. Anyone named Charles? David Feinzeit. Feinzeit. David. 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 We had a lot of no shows tonight. Will Folsom. Okay. Oh, perfect. All right. All right. Here. Take your pitch. Yeah. 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 Okay. Hardik Aurora. Oh, perfect. Katie Albers. Katie. Katie here? Katie. No Katie. No Katie. Okay. Uh, Young Zhao. Yep. Yep. Alexander Shearer. Okay. Negative. Negative. Oh, man. What's the How about Robin? What? Hold on. Okay, next. How about Batman? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Keith Xavier uh, Masquerade. Nice. Keith, uh, Perfect. Right. All right. Yeah, I think we'll leave. All right. How about Assis Kadan? Negative. Negative. Adam Sadowski. Negative. Tanning. Nope. Nope. <coughs> <Okay. laughs> I know. Yeah. Murthy Ratnala. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Woo. All right. Two more. Just two more. Two more. <laughs> um, Asif Motorala. Uh, Negative. Negative. Luke. Luke's? No Luke's. <laughs> no Luke's. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Erica Stockwell. Alpert. Negative. John O'Brien. No. Wow. You got to work on this friend of numbers. Just the right meaning. Joshua <laughs> Ledwell. <laughs> Joshua no. Ledwell. No. Paul Ricker. No, Paul's not here. No, Paul's not here. Yeah. <laughs> Aaron Bella. Tell you what, maybe I'll just sort of. I'll hide these somewhere <laughs> as. Uh, <laughs> Matt? 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 I did the right thing. Phil Skaroulis. Yeah. Phil yeah, Skaroulis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. All right, one more lucky winner. Okay, D. Lipton. Nope. Nope. Uh, Lisa Lynn. Nope. Nope. Jude. Jude. 
No? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ofer Tal. No. I think maybe we should just make an executive decision. This brave gentleman sitting here in the front. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. All right. Go. So I would ask you to put away your screens and this is to, this is completely out of software, but it's very human. And so this is an opportunity, and this is a piece of design. So this is an opportunity to Take something in which later you can reflect on and, and recognize as another design, and this in fact is a design across time, like this experience across time, like the software that we built. And just file it away when you're to call on when you're wanting to understand all the, all the sh forms that design take and perhaps specifically if you want to ask yourself a question besides why the hell am I still here, how did they get to this end result? What was that act of design that ended up with this product? How could we find the utility? What would we say is the purpose or the function? So again, forms, sketches, images, shapes, food for thought when asking yourself, what is, the des what, what is that process in the designer's mind when they're trying to reach for the final work that will be the user experience in our case? Great. Well, cool. Thank Thanks a lot, Thor. And Thor and Brian. Actually, we have the honorary Sweet. Django <laughs> Boston t-shirts. So, yes. well, this is a <laughs> Thor and this thank is a you. Brian. So thank, thank you guys you. very much. Cool. And um, and now time for beer, right? Cool. Mm -hmm. Sweet. Let's walk over in a couple minutes. We'll get organized. Great. Cool. Thanks again, everybody, for coming out. 45 yeah. degrees. Let's get the yeah, 45 we'll degrees out. <laughs> It is a challenging time. Hi.